Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're glad to have you here this morning. So glad that you turned out this morning. It is a beautiful day uh, here in Seattle. You couldn't get any better day with uh, blue skies and sunshine. And we are entering into the primo season here in the northwest of the United States. Of course, those of you that are down under are entering into the other side of things. But that's fine, too, because Torah goes around the world and our love for where all of you are as well. And we surely appreciate you watching us and joining in with us today for the Shabbat service. And we are still in the month of uh, ER. We're still during the time of the counting of the Omer. And uh, it's not that long before we are uh, going to be uh, celebrating the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. And um, there's a flyer that we have that's in the back, which uh, many of you can pick up. It's for the, our Feast of Shavuot celebration. And it says, when the fire fell twice, because it fell first at Sinai and then it fell on the day of Pentecost, uh, which was a little over 2,000 years ago. So are you fired up for Shabbat today and ready to receive whatever God has for you today? So let's stand and we'll have a prayer for the counting of the Omer and a time to uh, untangle our ways as we come through the door to be in God's sanctuary amongst each other to fellowship and to, uh, to study his Torah. So blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us concerning the counting of the Omer. Today is the 35th day of the counting of the Omer. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, who has called us to be a light to the nations and has given us Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you, Father, for this Shabbat. The time to rest with you and to be at peace with each other. And Father, that, uh, that we find no malice in our lives during this day, but we think about everything that we can do in every moment that can make our lives and other people's lives better. We thank you for that. Amen. Many of you that are here now, uh, and some of you do know, uh, and there are others that are watching us from around the world. You just tune in live streaming. You don't know very much about El Shaddai. But El Shaddai ministry started as a, as a Bible study. Uh, Pastor Mark and Vicki uh, and um, Norm and Sue Beliveau came from another church. We were all together in a church uh, 23 years ago. Uh, we all left at the same time. Uh, we all went our separate ways. And Pastor Mark and Vicki converged uh, with Norm and Sue Beliveau, converged back together later <clears throat> to start a Bible study, which became what's El Shaddai today. Well, as things are of no coincidence, uh, <clears throat> Yesterday, May 3rd, uh, was when Norm Beliveau passed away. And uh, Norm and, and Sue Beliveau, uh, and Sue, of course, is still on our board, uh, were pillars of this congregation. And uh, they put in a lot of self-sacrifice uh, to, uh, to help Mark and Vicki to begin this work, which they never anticipated that this would turn out how it turned out, which changes thousands of people's lives. And I want to take a moment because um, many of the things that we do today are as a result of what Norm Beliveau did. Uh, many of you recognize Norm when we were up at South Hill in Puyallup. And uh, he was the greeter, the greeter. He sat at a table with the notes and he handed them out to everybody, everyone. He knew who everyone was and he always had a smile and he was always warm. And quite frankly, uh, he protected um, El Shaddai in a lot of ways. He was the guardian of that door. And uh, th those of you that remember that church as well, uh, Norm and Sue always sat in the same place. Uh, Mari and myself, we sat either behind them or in front of them. I felt like Norm was uh, protecting me. Um, and, and that's how they conducted the congregation from there. Also, uh, Norm was a, a great companion and help to Pastor Mark. Uh, who helped him with baptisms and many other things, which uh, you're, you're aware of, because uh, Pastor Mark uh, in those days needed the help to do that. Uh, Norm was also there in all of the events that we began to do, the Passover Seders as we moved to larger locales like the Tacoma Dome. Norm was always there. Uh, he was always there very early and always helped out. Um, he, was a, he was a great man in that respect as being a workman and also being a man of God as well. And one thing about him, he liked cars. Many people don't know that Norm uh, was actually an inventor. Uh, he was in the auto industry, but he had invented uh, a transmission that Mazda later picked up on. And uh, I know that he's a great, he was a, a great 
man relative to cars because I know he fixed my car two or three times. In fact, my car was the last car he worked on before he passed away on that day. And so, uh, besides being a great man of God, he was also private first class in the army, uh, and he served in Korea, uh, where he's now laid to rest in the Veterans Cemetery. Uh, and so, you know, I want to take this time to, to give great allegiance and honor to Norm, who, um, who was a pillar of this congregation. So, I'd like to have a little bit of a round of applause for both Norm and Sue, but for Norm in recognizing him today. Now, this Torah portion today, it is a double Torah portion. And <clears throat> Behar, Behukatai, and it is the last, uh, the last Torah portions in the book of uh, Vayikra. And uh, they're kind of unusual, and I'll, I'll tell you that in, in just a moment. But I want to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, which kind of ties in with what I just talked about with, uh, with Norm, but also with uh, this Torah portion. And you'll see why at the end of the service today and what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians 3, 5, it says, Who then is Apollos? Who is Paul? But servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but who? God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are equal and each shall receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, which is the word husbandry, God's building. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I lay a foundation, and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that this word, it says, we're fellow workers with God, you are God's husbandry, which is an agricultural word. It has to do with the field. And the word uses, particularly, well, all through the word because of Israel, uh, uses a lot of applications relative to agriculture since the economy in Israel is dependent upon agriculture, or it was at that time when they came into the land. And God takes special note as to how his people steward his land. This week, um, my wife and I, Mari, we were at Point Defiance Park in Tacoma, which is, is a very beautiful park. And uh, actually, I was telling somebody the other day that the man who designed Point Defiance uh, Park in Tacoma uh, also designed Central Park in New York. So if you've been to Central Park, you see some similarities. But we were walking along the waterfront and we were headed back towards the car. It was a beautiful day like today. And over on the, by a path, there was a, there was a lady. She had to be between 70 and 80, I would say. And she had a plastic bag. And she was going along and she was picking up the trash. You know, and I just thought, bless her heart. You know, and as we came closer to her, she looked up. And I said, you're doing a good thing. She said, I'm doing my part. And, and so we left and we did some other things. And, but then as we were leaving and turning a corner... Here was a street by these stores, and this lady was there again with a plastic bag, and she was picking up garbage on the street. It's just incredible that she was doing her part, what she felt for the community, to steward that community or that little town. Hey, bring up that PowerPoint for me. This is from uh, a news agency in Israel. It says Netanyahu. Uh, he made a comment that Israel, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which is constant, uh, isn't about territory. Uh, the peace deal would go to a referendum. And, uh, and so he, he claims it's not about the land. What he says in this particular, uh, in his speech, was that what it's about is the Palestinians recognize that Israel is a state, and that Palestinian, Palestine could uh, exist side by side, but... Uh, they needed to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, and it wasn't really about the territory. So there would be a referendum before any deal with the, with the PA, uh, and a referendum will be called before Israel surrenders any land to the PA state. And so it's interesting that, uh, and that's what I so like about El Shaddai, is because as we study Torah, 
We see that what's happening in the world today, that Israel always has something to do with what's going on that determines the destiny of all men. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1, this beginning of this Torah portion, Bahar, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses in the mount, in Mount Sinai, Bahar, uh, saying, and, uh, you know, why is it here at the, end, uh, at the end of this Torah portion in Vayikra, he brings it up again and he goes into a whole bunch of different commandments about the land and how the land's to be treated, how the people would be treated in the land, but he brings up in the mount. That's the title of this Torah portion. He says, speak to the children of Israel and say, when you come into the land which I give you, which means he was telling them ahead of time because it was going to be a long time before they got there. And most of those people were going to be dead. So they're going to have to, well, they're all going to be dead. Uh, but as the people multiplied through 40 years, they were to pass the commandments on. The Torah was written down. When you come into the land, when they finally come into the promised land, which I give you, then the land will keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Well, isn't that something? Well, we get here together for Shabbat, but he's telling them, there's, there needs to tell them there's gonna be a Shabbat for the land too. That's pretty unusual. Now, here's something. Today, on the Hebrew calendar, this is the 24th day of ER, I think, pretty sure. Two days ago was the 22nd of ER. Why is that significant? Because that was the time when the children of Israel came out of Egypt when they ran out of unleavened bread, okay? Which they brought with them from Egypt. So the origin of the Sabbath actually had to do with them running out of unleavened bread and how God commanded them on what to do. So the origin of this actually took place on the 22nd when the Lord commanded them, you can bring up that next slide for me so they can get a picture of this, uh, when he actually commanded them concerning collecting the manna and to collect it in a double portion. Okay, it's amazing how the Lord does things in cycles and in patterns. And so he told them that day, he says, okay, on this day, the next day, you're gonna collect a double portion of the manna that comes down. And why? Because the Shabbat is a day of rest from creation and you're not gonna do anything so you need the double portion for that day. And it won't rot, it'll last for another day. And so it says in Exodus 16, 22, it says, it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said to them, this is that which the Lord hath said, tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. And then in verse 26, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day which is the Shabbat in it there shall be none. So no manna was going to fall because they would have a double portion that would last through the Shabbat. This is what uh, was the beginning of what God would explain uh, under what conditions the earth uh, and all of its resourceful treasures would be entrusted to man, particularly to the children of Israel. This is kind of an unusual Torah portion, and those of you that, come, that came here to the church for the first time and you, you wanted me to talk about how great you are and God loves you and everything, this is a little bit different. <laughs> All right? This is still God's word, it's, uh, and he's telling us how we're supposed to treat the land and how we're supposed to treat each other. So this Torah portion takes a concept of the Shabbat, of being six days that men ought to work, and on the seventh, it's a day of rest. But it takes this concept of six days of work and takes it to a higher level. That's what this Torah portion is about, where the days become weeks and the weeks become years. And this is what was measured and what was known in seven times seven cycles of years. Uh, the 50th year, the 50th being what's known as the Jubilee or the Yovel. And so here's, this is how he did it. It was called the Shemitah cycle. Uh, and it's such that the land could be tilled and it could be worked for six years and then it would go fallow on the seventh and then uh, on the seventh year they were not permitted to work the land but the land had to have rest it was called the Shemitah cycle so there was seven times seven so it's, isn't it interesting that here we are in, in during the time of the counting of the Omer which is what seven times seven weeks uh, which we end up on the 50th day which is what's known as Shava Odor Pentecost, when the fire fell twice uh, and the Lord brought forth the Torah the first time and the Holy Spirit the second time for all, for all men. But now, here, here he's talking about seven times seven years, 
which there's, is a period of time, and on the 50th year is a time of jubilee. On the Shemitah years, the ground was to be left fallow. They weren't to plant anything. So look at, God is showing them here, and I'm going to tell you this. This was to remind them that God was the true owner of the land. Right? He brought them into the land. He's telling them, when you come in, nothing's, on the seventh year, you're not going to grow anything. Because they were dependent upon that food. Then he says in verse 23 of Leviticus 25, this land shall not be sold forever, for the land is what? Mine. And he picked that little area there right in the Middle East on the Mediterranean. This land is mine. This is the one I'm working with here. For you are strangers and foreigners with me. So in the Jubilee year, it goes to even a higher level that even the depraved, people who made mistakes, would get a reprieve. And in the Jubilee year, everybody would start over. So listen carefully on this, because if you have any connections with the government, this is the way to go. Okay? In the 50th year, everybody's debts were canceled, slaves were let go, and uh, land would go back to the original owners in the family. God did this as a way to protect the tribes that were in the land, the people that he had chosen. And he wanted, he knew that during this period of time, people would be swapping land, people would go into debt, people would be, you know, they'd have to sell themselves to go to work. Just, we, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. Is there a couple of you here that make mistakes? There's one over there. <laughs> we all make mistakes and we, <clears throat> you know, we get messed up in land deals or whatever it is. And God knew, okay, in 50, by the 50th year, Everybody, it all gets leveled out. And he wanted all the tribes to go back to their original land. Okay, they could, it would be redeemed for them. So that was the higher level they could start. And all the land would go back to the original owner. The slaves are freed and debts are canceled. Then it was to show them that the real owner of the land and the master of all of them was compassionate. And bring up that PowerPoint, it was actually signaled by the blowing of the shofar which has a number of different reasons why it's blown. Now, I want to back up for a second. Many of you may have heard of a, of a sage or a rabbi that lived in the 19th century. His name was Kofetz Chaim. He wrote a number of books, but one of them that he wrote was on the laws of proper speech or how to, how to combat Lashon Hara, which is the slanderous and the evil tongue. And so he was a very wise sage, and he was known all over uh, in, in Judaism. And, uh, and so he, he was sitting in his house, and this uh, rich man came to visit him. And he came into Kofitz Kaim's house and he said, and he looked at his house and it, was just a, it wasn't a very big room and he had just this, this little table and a, and a rickety bench and then the kitchen didn't have any amenities or anything and so this wealthy man looked at him and said, how do you live like this? And he said, he says, well, he says, how did you, how did you get here? He goes, well, I came in my coach. So Kofitz Kaim got up. He went outside and he looked at this coach and he says, it's very nice, but I don't see any bed in here. I don't see any kitchen. I don't see any chairs or, or anything like that. He goes, well, I don't need these because I'm traveling and so I'm just passing through. I'm leaving them someplace else. He goes, yes, that's very right. That's why I don't collect a lot of amenities and things because I'm just passing through this world for 80 or 90 years. I'm passing through to go to the world to come. And so the Jews look at the Shemitah year, the Jubilee, as a time of, of a type of the world to come. When God shows his compassion, when everything goes back to, his, to the original owner so they can have a clear mind. Now why is it signaled by a blast of the shofar in Yom Kippur is when it's blasted and the Jubilee takes place shortly after that. Well, what is the, the Yom Kippur? It's the Day of Atonement. What happens on the Day of Atonement? Israel's sins are, are forgiven. Uh, the sanctuary is cleansed. The high priest offers uh, offerings uh, to cleanse himself of sin and the sanctuary, so everything gets clean on, the, on Yom Kippur. What a better time to truly signify that it would be only by the full forgiveness of sins that the liberty of the children of Israel could commence with their lives. So what I'm trying to do is paint you a picture here. You're starting to feel a little better, even though we're talking about the land and the jubilee. And so when, when the prime minister says it's not about the land, God has, seems to have a different view about that. The concluding part of this, he wants the land to rest. The concluding part of the, this Parsha, the last verse, it says, you shall keep my Sabbaths. 
So he's not only talking about the Sabbath, he's talking about the feast. He's meaning also the, the uh, relative to the land having a Sabbath. The land needs to rest. And you know what? What this did for the children of Israel, it built great faith. Because put yourself in their shoes. You're a farmer. Everybody somehow is dependent upon the produce. And after the sixth year, the next year, you have to let the land go fallow. But the land still produced. It produced enough to get the farmer and his family and others uh, to, uh, to make it through with food. Now today, uh, in Israel, they still, there are many farmers that still observe the Shemitah year and they let their, their ground go fallow. Uh, but uh, as smart as Jewish people are, they find other ways to bring produce in so they always have food. See, but when those days it produced great faith because you had the trust that God was going to produce. But you know what? You really even needed really even more faith when it came to the Jubilee. Of course, all the land would be given back, all the debts canceled, all of that. But on the Jubilee, it was two, over two years. So it wasn't until the third year that they could go back and plant. Talk about believing God and realizing that he's telling you, let the land go, they, it needs to rest unto me. Isn't that incredible? Well, why was there a Shemitah? Why was there a Jubilee? Because it had a connection with the creation itself. Even though the Sabbath, it might have been the, one of the last things in God's creation, which was the seventh day that God, he saw everything that it was good and he rested. And so that became the Shabbat. But it may have been one of the first things in his thinking. Look at verse 4 of Leviticus 25. In the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. A Sabbath for the Lord. The world and the creation itself would be renewed every Shabbat. That was the reason that Israel would dwell in the land was to steward the resources and the purposes of God. Did you ever think about that? Okay, how about what I just said? That the Shabbat, being a time of rest, is also a time of renewal for all the creation. And let that sink in for a minute. Yeah, but we can meet any day of the week. Well, I don't, go ahead and meet every day of the week. Have Bible studies. You can meet in church any day of the week. But we're not talking about meeting in a church. We're talking about Shabbat. We're talking about the Sabbath. God says, this is a time of rest. It's a renewal for all the creation. Meet, and that means, guess what? You're one of those created beings. Look at Psalm 92 on your notes. What's the title of this psalm? It says, a psalm or a song for the Sabbath day. And it reads, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Now, it says that this is a song for the Sabbath day, and how did the psalmist come up with this title? Well, I'm going to read something to you. It actually is from the Sansino Kumash. There's some, a lot of different types of Kumashs. Rashi had a Kumash, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then, of course, you have, many of you have an art scroll Kumash. This is from the Sansino, and it says this title actually appears in the Targum, and they say that it was a psalm, this song, it was a song which Adam uttered on the first Shabbat, and it was composed by him. And that this psalm was sung by Levites in the temple every Shabbat. But there was a rabbi later on uh, whose name was Israel Abraham that stated it had no connection with the Sabbath. Well, they can kind of toss things around like however they feel sometimes. But when Rashi, who was a great rabbi, he commented on it and he spoke that this psalm actually had to do with the world to come. And here's why. He said, the psalmist lived in a world where workers of iniquity flourished, bringing hardship and anxiety to the righteous. Now, does that seem to parallel anything that's going on in the world today? It's where workers of iniquity always seem to flourish in the world, right? But on the Sabbath, watch this. And I'm now I'm not just talking about this Sabbath that we're meeting, but the Sabbath of the land. Man's spiritual nature is heightened and fortified, and vision is made clearer. He then views the situation with a more optimistic outlook. The character of the spiritual is impressed upon him uh, so that he takes his eyes off from the physical world. 
Exalted by this vision, he is able to sing the praises of this psalm even before the wicked are overthrown. So you want to know that one of the purposes of the Sabbath is to renew his creation so that when you're at Shabbat, whatever it is that you're doing, that you're resting, God is renewing his creation because you're resting like he said you were supposed to do. And the man who partakes in that, which is what this psalm is all about, is renewed in his vision. He sees the world and the wickedness around him, but the Shabbat renews him to a point where he's spiritually elated and he can face the world as it is without being worried about the wicked. Does God deserve a hand on that one? And I'm going to stop in one second here, but, because I'm going to go into something else, but this, not, to, not to put a pin in the balloon, in the next Torah portion, which is Behukatai, which is talking about his statutes, there's a structure, a sevenfold list of actual punish, punishments because they spiraled away or they would spiral away from on violating the Sabbath. And this was the cause and the destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying away of the Jews to Babylon in Jeremiah's time, which I'm going to cover in this half Torah portion. If Israel kept the Sabbath of the land, then there would be a blessing of rain in due season. And what would be the result of that? <clears throat> Look at Leviticus 25:18, And bring up that next PowerPoint for me. Wherefore, you shall do my statutes, which is Bahukatai, and keep my judgments and do them, and you shall dwell in the land in what? In safety. And then it says, and the land shall yield her fruit, <clears throat> and you shall eat your fill and dwell in safety. So when they kept the Sabbath of the land, they would dwell in safety, and even during those years that the ground was fallow, everybody would have plenty to eat. So I'll tell you, if you have food on the table, you have a roof over your head, and your family, you're blessed. Amen? Let's all stand. Father, <clears throat> Lord, thank you that, uh, Father, you've given us guidelines and boundaries to go on. And Father, that even though uh, people in the past have made mistakes, we can look at that and we can... Uh, we can make corrections in our life, in our lifestyle, and see, uh, Father, how you, you asked us to do uh, what your Torah says. So, Father, I ask that for this congregation uh, in the way that we in this civilized world, even though we're not in the land, that we find a way to be the best stewards of the creation and observe your, your Sabbaths. Uh, Lord, so that we might do your will and we might see a glimpse of the world to come. Bless the people that give of their abundance, that have to work, that work all week. Um, Father, and that of the, the little bit that they have, they share with El Shaddai so that we can bring this word of Torah to those who don't know about it. Even though they've known about you, they don't know about your Torah. And we thank you for that together. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator, and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Amen. Let's take a break. Okay, welcome back everyone, and uh, let's take our seats so we can get started here. Good to see every one of you coming back, and some more that, of you that joined us uh, in the second half. Welcome uh, to those of you that are just joining us uh, on live streaming. We're glad to have you, and uh, hope your weather is as beautiful where you are as it is here. Uh, and uh, I hope that you're blessed wherever you are, if you're in a meeting room with others or just you and your husband or you're just watching on your computer. Uh, we think about you, we pray about you every day, and thank you for, uh, for watching us and for believing in Torah. Um, I know that today we have some guests here, and I want to acknowledge you in just a moment, but uh, I want to remind you, how many of you, you of course you, most of you here know who Israel Stefanski is. And uh, I got a note from him, and we've been corresponding with him. He uh, darts in and out of Israel in some places that you probably wouldn't want to be, uh, puts his life on the line. But he sent me an email, and he said, uh, if, you know, those of you that do donate, and if it's possible, uh, the ISF, which would be the Israeli 
support fund. I'm thinking about if it's the IDF or the IAF, but he said uh, to donate for the, a Bible project that they have and for soldiers that are in need. Uh, and uh, he appreciates everything that, uh, that you do here and that we do at El Shaddai for him. So I just want you to remember that. Now, um, yes, where are our ushers? Why don't our ushers raise our hands? So I know who you are. There's one over there. Okay, we have some guests that have, uh, are visiting with us today. If you could raise your hands, we have something we want to give you and bless you with. And particularly if you've come the furthest, we have a gift for you as well. And there's somebody raising a hand for someone else. Okay, maybe this is a guestless day today. Oh, right over here, where are you from? Tukwila. Tukwila. You know, some of you folks uh, that, that are uh, part of churches and so on, you know, you drive down the block or half a mile, these folks come 50 miles to come here or further. Over here, where are you folks from? You have to speak up, my mental telepathy just, I'm sorry? L.A. You brought the sunshine up here, over here. Nevada. Nevada. And anyone else over here? University Place. That's in Washington. That's in Tacoma. And there was someone else over here? Tacoma. Lots of Tacomaites. Anyone else that we have? Over here? Kent, East Hill of Kent. That's not in England, that's here in uh, Washington. Over, anyone else over here? Federal Way. Federal Way. Okay, well, let's see. L.A., Nevada, you and the tip furthest. Who's, oh, there's one more? Right here. Louisiana. Louisiana. Oh, that's it. Let's see. L.A. is a 1,000 miles from here. Louisiana is is much further. So here's the Louisiana. Anybody else before we say going once, going twice, she wins a gift for coming the furthest. Let's have a hand for our Louisiana person. <laughs> Pastor Mark has always said it would be wonderful to give a gift to those watching us live streaming who are watching the furthest. Economically, that would not work out for El Shaddai, but we're glad <laughs> that you're watching us anyway. All right, why don't we stand? Uh, we'll get started with our worship service. Um, you know, we're going into a change of season. It's just, a, if, at least for here, and of course, maybe where you are as well, the weather changes, things change in people's lives, and uh, it's a change of season also spiritually many times. And so, uh, when, sometimes the seasons aren't as we would like them to be in our life, but nevertheless, God is working no matter what. Take this time now to, to focus your thoughts towards God. Forget about what's happened outside these doors and expect great things for God to talk to you. Amen? So, Lord, we thank you for this time that we have, just this little part of the Shabbat, that we're together here corporately and, of course, those around the world, that uh, together we join in prayer and worship you and acknowledge you. That, Father, during this Shabbat, this time that you are renewing creation, Father, renew a great work, renew our spirits today. In the name of our God, who is our salvation, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. It seems that our hope, Father, can get diminished because there's not peace around us. But you said that you are Adonai Shalom. You are the God who destroys the authority that causes chaos. And Father, that there, there might be somebody that's here today or that's watching, and it's just how can we get out of this mess that we're in? Why is there so much turmoil that's around me? Father, that communicate to their hearts to withdraw from the turmoil and to run to you because, Father, in you there is a sanctuary, and you hear us when we cry unto you. 
So those, Father, that are despairing because of a decision that they have to make or they have people chasing them, or, Father, just the cares of this world chases them, Father, that they, they come to your word, that they take that extra time, that little bit of discipline to, to go to your word, to have you guide and to direct them on what they need to, to think. And then, Father, that sometimes it's just a matter of thinking and where we fall short of that, that your supernatural power kicks in and draws us forward to deliverance. So I pray for those people that are here today, families that were husband and wife are torn because of one believes this, the other one believes Torah, that, Father, you'll bring great understanding to, to each of those spouses. So that, Father, that they may be one in their faith and in their believing and know what you have in store for us today, that there can be peace and peace between husband and wife, husbands and wives that are here that are at odds with each other. Uh, Lord, that's not your desire. Your desire is a cod, to be together as one. So, Father, we pray for that together today as we focus upon you. And that, Lord, on the subject of, of being in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, that, Father, that our nation can be together as one. That, Father, that the stars and stripes that had blood on them, those that are, are wounded warriors and fallen soldiers, that, Father, that they didn't fight for nothing and they don't fight for anything, but that the people in this country can rise up and turn again once to you, again to you. And that, Father, that the, the, the silos and the towers of deceit that are in perhaps in our government, whether it's in the administration or in Congress or Senate, in the entertainment industry, in our civil authorities, Father, in our merchandising. Father, tear down those silos and bring judgment where it be, but build it up, Father, with those that are trust in your word so that we can once again look to you. Bless this country, Father, but spare the remnant, Father, who is serious about knowing you, that this land might have peace that this land might be healed. And not only our land, but all nations, Father, that trust in you and trust in your Torah. For Israel, that, Father, that they realize that their thoughts on the unity of the nation, Father, and for security is based upon what your Torah says. Just have them return to that. Have somebody look to that, Lord. The prime minister in that administration, the IDF, that there be more soldiers that respect your Torah, to remember that it is you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who took them out of Egypt and placed them in the land to begin with. We praise you for that, Father, that we realize that one day our Mashiach will come and we will all look on him on whom they have pierced. And we will glory in you because yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. We're blessed that everybody that partakes and helps out here. Uh, and, you know, I want to mention something, too. We get a lot of emails, and I know people think, you know, when these cameras, when they span the audience here, you know, there's a lot of empty seats. Well, just so you know, it is a large auditorium. It is 1,300 seats. We don't always have 1,300 people here or even 1,000, but we do fill it up on special events. So don't think that it happens to be a vacant congregation. We do have people that do come to El Shaddai as well as you that are around the world. Okay. Now, you people are probably wondering, how is Pastor Art going to do this? We're just on page two. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I know how it's set up, so I know how we, I just fly through certain things, so just be patient. You'll get it. But here we are. We're on the Jubilee. We're on the Lord commanding a, sh a Shabbat for his land. And to show you the effect of it, I want to go into the half Torah portion for Bahar, which is in the book of Jeremiah. This was the cause, one of the causes of the destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying away of the Jews, as I had mentioned. If Israel kept the Sabbath, there would be blessings of rain and due seasons. And then the last note that I had there was Leviticus 25, 18. If they kept the statutes and judgments, they would dwell in safety. The land would yield fruit. But if they were unfaithful, 
the rains would cease, and this is what happened during Jeremiah's time. There are events that happen in this half Torah, uh, which are elements of the, the Shemitah year and the Jubilee that link to this Torah portion, showing God's faithfulness and his attributes. Some people have said, I just can't figure God out. Well, if you studied the Word, if you studied the Torah, you'd begin to see how he operates, and then you could live your lives accordingly. Well, while Jerusalem was being attacked and ramparts were sieging her walls, the Jews were being carried off to Babylon, but God promises that he will bring them back. God's promises are yea and amen. He always does what he says, and he says what he means. Do you believe that? Okay, the half Torah portion, just so that you want to know, the Torah is Genesis through Deuteronomy. The half Torah portion is uh, what the sages put together uh, uh, that are relative to the prophets, which is everything else after Deuteronomy through Malachi. And they correspond with the Torah portion. That's why it's called the half Torah portion. But in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 1, I'm going to give you a little background. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. It was, this was going to be the, Israel was going to be drawn out of the land into captivity. Those who go into captivity were those that were not destroyed by sword and pestilence. And so... Nebuchadnezzar had sieged Jerusalem with its armies and it's coming down to the final moment. He keeps trying to tell Israel, get out of the land. And there's a reason why. Jeremiah was the prophet. Ezekiel was already in Babylon prophesying that Israel would be expelled from the land, but God would bring them back. How could you possibly envision? Look at everything. It's a mess. And then it says in verse 2, For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. What a great place to be is in prison when the, when the city is being sieged. You know, <laughs> having a little bit of optimism for your life. Well, in verse 6, it says, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, now the Lord is telling this to Jeremiah while he's in prison. Now, can you keep a good state of mind when you're in prison? Well, I don't know, I haven't been in prison, but if you have, you can come up and testify. But it says, Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hannah Miel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle shall come to thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, just a little background, Anathoth is in actually in, in, in Benjamin, which was Jeremiah's birthplace. It was a Levitical town on the edge of the Judean wilderness, uh, which is northeast of Jerusalem. And so God tells Jeremiah, while he's in prison, while the city's being sieged, your, un- your, your cousin is going to come and he's going to, he wants you to buy this field. So that really works out logically, doesn't it? You want me to buy land now while this whole place is being besieged and people are being taken into captivity? But he didn't question it. It corresponds with the Torah portion, Leviticus 25, verse 25. It says, if thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man has none to redeem it, and himself is able to redeem it. This was an arrangement by God. This is from the Torah portion as part of the Shemitah and the Jubilee that if he falls into bad times, he can come to somebody who is his relative and says, here, this, you can have this land, you know, you can redeem it. And then it's yours, of course, until the Jubilee because was, it was part of the family. So it was the Lord's arrangement. In doing that, it was a time and it was a means for him to purchase the land. Why? Jerusalem was in siege. Why would you be buying land now unless you were a Jerusalem realtor or something? Well, it was for a prophetic purpose. So what happens in Jeremiah 32, 8? So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord. And he said to me, buy my field. I pray thee that is an Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine. See, it corresponds with Leviticus. And the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. And then he said, then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Man, how would you like to get those kind of specific directions? Especially if you're a realtor. (laughs) 
Hannah, Neal, Hannah Miel was most likely child, childless, possibly, so the land would then stay in the family if Jeremiah would buy this property. And, and uh, in fact, it says in Jeremiah 32, 9, this isn't on your notes, but he says, Jeremiah says, I bought the field uh, of Hadamiel, my uncle's son that was in Anathoth, and weighed out the money, uh, even 17 shekels of silver. They didn't have, he didn't have little coins. The way they did it is they actually weighed out the silver that amounted to these 17 shekels, and he paid for the property. It's not a whole lot. That was a small price for a track of land, but there was a reason that it was for a small price. Why? Well, in the Torah portion, Leviticus 25, 15, according to the number of years after the Jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according unto the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee, according to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it, for according to the number of the years of the fruits does he sell it unto thee. Pull up that PowerPoint for me, that next one. And I'm going to read this here in a minute. But here's what's going on. During the Jubilee, if you bought, if, if somebody were going to redeem the land or somebody was going to sell you the property, if you were, say, 25 years out from the Jubilee and your family bought this track of land, you had 25 years to do what with the land? Planted, right? Cultivate it. And when you did that, what would happen? Well, you would have 25 years worth of income or whatever from that produce from that property. So what the Lord is, is saying here is that when you do that, if you, that's going to determine what the price of the property is. This is what you call God's just ways so that nobody gets beat. Okay, so what if you're three years out? Well, you only have three years, you're not going to get as much produce from that land. So God says, well, the land isn't going to be worth that much because it's going to be redeemed in three years anyway because it's going to go back to the original owner. So this was God's just way of doing things. And in Leviticus 25, 27, it says, which is from the Torah portion, let him count the years of the sale, restore the overplus to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return it unto his possession. But if he's not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. So everybody got covered. You could still prosper from it. If you're going to sell it, it would just be less as you went on. And so here, here where, where are we in the position with Jubilee? And Jeremiah is told by God, pick up this property, okay? Now, I want to go on a rabbit trail for just a minute. Those of you that have read the book of Acts, remember the book of Acts? It's in the New Testament. And... After the day of Pentecost and, the, and the, uh, the assembly, the called out of the believers is growing, the apostles uh, are kind of watching over everything in the church. People are selling lands. People are bringing things uh, for the movement of, uh, and to care for people and so on. And then Ananias and Sapphira come. Remember, they give their peace, right? And, and it shakes everybody up. And this is a little research project for you, but think of it in light of this. Because they brought the money that they only brought part of it, Okay. And so uh, there is a, there's actually was a theologian in the 1700s, Bishop Lightfoot, that claims it was a time during Shemitah or even could possibly be the Jubilee where this, uh, they, they, they sold it, they only brought part of the money that they were supposed to. In other words, they had beat somebody on the price of the land and they didn't bring God the due amount that was on the land. So that's an interesting side note. It just shows you the Hebraic nature of even the book of Acts. But let's get back to Jeremiah. Now look at what Jeremiah goes to. He buys the land, he weighs out the silver. And then he says in verse 10, and I subs subscribe the evidence, which is meaning this, this uh, little contract that was written up, and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances and I took the evidence of the purchase both that was, which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. Bring up that PowerPoint for me there, that slide. Uh, however this was written out, whether it was on a clay tablet, there was actually two, there's no carbon copies in those days, no printers, no computers. There was actually two contracts written, one that they could see on the outside and one that was put inside of a satchel or a bag. Okay, and so he went to all of this trouble and it says it was according to the custom, making sure that this was a sure deal. And he says in verse 12, I gave the evidence 
uh, of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, and the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hannah Miel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. He really went to, he made sure everybody, first he had the contract all written out in the satchel the way it was supposed to, right? I mean, he was going to a big deal to make sure I'm getting this land. In verse 14, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Well, in verse 13, he charged Baruch before them, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, the evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and the evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. He goes even further than that. He shows them everything that he did with the contract. Then he says, now go put it in an earthen jar that's going to last for a long time, like a time capsule. Okay, he's really going, he's really making the efforts, and God is showing him to do this. Why? And verse 15, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. You talk about the assurance. God says, make sure everybody knows about this, because with everything that you see going on right now, I am going to restore all of this. Now, is that the kind of God that you want to be linked to? God was using the sale of the land as a reassurance to the Jews that they would return to the land and it would once again produce. So the deed was put in a jar and stored for a long time, just like those uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in Qumran that lasted thousands of years, okay? So Jeremiah has a prayer. And in this prayer, he is recounting how Israel came to this point in their walk with God and why this was happening. And in Jeremiah 32, verse 21, he's talking about Israel. He says, you brought forth your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm and great terror. The nations knew it. Notice it always comes back to how he redeemed and brought Israel out of Egypt. And that's why you should always remember where you were before you got saved. Never forget that. And if you can't remember it, then you may need to think back if you were ever saved in the first place. Because I'll tell you, I don't, I've never forgotten that day. And it says in verse 22, and it says, And has given them this land, which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they came in. And they possessed the land, but they didn't obey your voice, nor did they walk in your law. Therefore, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. They have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. So what did that include? Well, that must have included not having a Sabbath in the land, letting the land lie fallow. And in so Jeremiah 32, verse 24, Jeremiah's further praying here, And he says, behold, and this is right after he does the deal, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword, famine, and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. Why, what thou didst speak has come to pass, and behold, thou seest it. You bring up that next slide for me, and what what he was talking about with the siege mounds, and I know it's difficult to see this, but here's the gate going into Jerusalem, into the city, Here's the actual walls here. Wish we had a brighter projector. Here's the city back here. But what they would do is they would bring towers and they would bring to, uh, uh, things to build up dirt and so on up against the wall so that eventually it would be built up and the armies could just go siege right over the walls and take the city. And that's what was happening. He says this happened just like you said it was going to happen. And so prior to this, Jeremiah had a prayer showing God's faithfulness and his attributes. And so he says in verse, chapter 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Now, listen, watch this, what he's saying. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open unto all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. 
So he says this about God. He mentions what God is like, and he, he mentions the word loving kindness, which is the word chesed in Hebrew. Where have we seen this before? This is a long time after Moses was in the wilderness when the Torah was given. A long, long time. Where do we see this before? Look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, after they had come out of Egypt. The Lord passed by before him. This is talking about Moses. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children into the third and fourth generation. Now this word here, does that look familiar? That long time before Jeremiah. This here in Exodus 34 verse 6 where it says keeping mercy for thousands is that same word chesed which is mentioned in Je Jeremiah mentions in his prayer which is actually loving kindness. So what Jeremiah is doing here, he is recounting what the attributes of God were that Moses mentioned way back when they were in the wilderness. That's a long time. So what does that tell you about Jeremiah? He knew the Torah, that he, and he knew the attributes of God, that God would come through on what he said and what he meant. And you see that in verse seven. He recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them corresponds with 34.6 of Exodus, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. All that God was doing here was carrying out his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What does that mean? Well, it means that there would be great blessings if they, if they stayed with the Torah, and if they didn't, that God would by no means clear the guilty. He, it says in the words that he, in Romans, he is just and he's the justifier of them which believe. Okay, so God is just. And when he was just when he gave his Torah, he said, if you do this, you'll get the rain, you'll get the produce, you'll get the fruit, the blessings. If you don't do this, this is going to happen to you. And it happened, just as Jeremiah mentions in his prayer. And so in verse, chapter 32, verse 25, Thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy the field for money and take witnesses, for the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. And then came the, the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So what the Lord was saying is, is that you, you know now that I can do this. When in the, in the face of hopelessness, that Jeremiah could believe that everything was going to be all right, and that's why he had him buy this land. Now there's a story, it's actually in this book you've heard Pastor Mark, it's Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. And uh, it's interesting because in Hungary there were uh, these two families in the 1900s, uh, and it was in Munkasa, and uh, there was a Munkasa rabbi uh, who was associated with another individual by the name of Bacon Hasid, which was part of the Hasidic family. And uh, now this is in the 1900s, so during the time of World War I in Hungary. And here was this rabbi, uh, who was Manka the Mankasa rabbi, and this other individual, Bacon Hasid, who the two families didn't get together, get along very well together. There was a controversy between them. And it was a heated argument one day between this rabbi of Munkasa and this other individual, Bacon Hasid. And the rabbi turns to him, who's a Sadiq, and he says, you! You're going to die in your talit katan. And the talit katan is something that they wear underneath their garments. And so this Bekan Hasid took it personally and remembered this, that he would, that the Sadiq, this righteous guy said, you're going to die with your talit katan on. And he remembered that. So World War II comes along. And all right around 1933, 1943, 44, the Nazis go into this town, and the town is dispersed. All the Jews are taken out and taken to Auschwitz, including this rabbi and this guy, Bekin Hasid. One thing that happened in these prison camps and in Auschwitz, it was forbidden for any Jew to wear a tallit katan. And so this Bekin Hasid said, as he saw everybody dying in the camp, that 
I know I'm going to be all right. I know I'm going to get through this camp because it's forbidden to wear a tallit katan. And the Sadiq said so. So I'll be all right. And so in 1977, as he was giving this in an interview, he said he believed the words of the Sadiq, which shows that even when there's a curse that you're going to die with, die with your tallit katan on, it turns into something good. And that's what happened here with Jeremiah buying a land in the midst of desolation that God would bring something good out of something that looks so terrible. Well, what was one of the reasons why Israel was carried away to Babylon? And it's in 2 Chronicles. Are we moving ahead here? 2 Chronicles 36, 20. Them that had escaped from the sword, talking about the captivity, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. For what reason? What, one of the reasons why they were there. Watch this, how it links with the Torah portion. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her what? Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years, which is 70 years, which is how long they were in Babylon. So when God says give the land a Sabbath, what does he mean? Is there something about doing that that, has, that is involved with the stewardship of this very planet itself? He's the creator. In fact, it said in Isaiah 10, 21, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. You see, the Sanhedrin were the ones, at the counting of the Omer, who's responsible to count? Well, we are. We count up to the counting up to that, the 50th day. And actually, I'm gonna give you a little assignment there's th only three places in the Torah that it talks about counting up. One of them is counting the Omer up to the 50th day to Shavuot. The second one is counting the Jubilee. But it, it took more responsibility because there was a number of years involved, so it was the Sanhedrin's responsibility to count those years. And then there was an, only one more responsibility in Torah for a man and a woman to count seven days to purity. But you have to look up why they had to do that, because I don't want to say it online. <laughs> but the Sanhedrin were responsible, and by the time of the Second Temple era, the, law, the laws of Jubilee were not being observed. So people were not, uh, uh, slaves were not being set free, the land was not lying fallow for the time, and so on. Nobody really knew when to begin the count. And it wasn't observed during the captivity. So the sages claim that the Jubilee only applied when all of the 12 tribes were returned into the land. In Leviticus 25.10 it says, And you shall hollow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto, unto all the inhabitants thereof. Okay, this is how they claim that there will not be a jubilee again until all the 12 tribes are back in the land. Now, we're talking about what's happening in the world to come, heading towards the world to come. All 12 tribes have to be present, and unless they are, all the inhabitants are not present. So the land cannot be returned to its rightful owners. All 12 tribes must return. All tribal affiliations have to be established. This is what the Messiah will do when he returns to return the dispersed of Israel to their land to where their tribe belongs and he will reparcel the land. You tell me it doesn't match, it's not about territory? Well, God seems to think so because it's going to be the Messiah's job, Yeshua, when he comes back to get everybody back where they're supposed to be so this planet can be in balance for the world to come for whatever it is that God has in store for us. Isn't that something? Well, when they came into the land, okay, after Moses died, it was divided by what was called Lot, L-O-T, to the tribes. Look at Joshua chapter 14, verse 1. Are you still with me? I'm doing all right here. See, I told you. Get through this. It says, these are the inheritances which the children of Israel took in the land of Canaan. Verse 2, it says, by the Lot of their inheritance. And I want you to keep those two words in your head, Lot and inheritance. When the Messiah comes, the division of the lot will be the same by the 12 tribes. This is noted in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 13. Thus saith the Lord, Yehovah, this shall be the border, where, now this is in the future, whereby you shall divide the land for inheritance 
according to all the tribes of Islam. Oh, sorry about that. Of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, not the United States, not Australia, not the European Union, the 12 tribes of Israel. In verse 21, so shall you divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. And it'll come to pass that you'll divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you. Okay, so those same words, the lot of your inheritance. Keep this in your head. And to the strangers that sojourn in you. Well, how many of you here know you're not Jewish? You're going to be part of those strangers who shall beget children among you. And they'll be unto you as a home born among the children of Israel, and they'll have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. Good deal. It'll come to pass that in what tribe the, sta- the stranger sojourns, there shall you give him his inheritance, says the Lord God, Yehovah. So there's an inheritance for everybody. Isn't that good? All right, well, be a little more excited about that. That word lot... <laughs> That word lot is the Hebrew word uh, goral. Uh, it means, uh, you know, small stones that are actually laid down to measure out something. But look at what the psalmist said in, in Psalm 16, verse 5. He says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. The book of Numbers gives the direction on these inheritances. And it's not in your notes, but I'll read you in Numbers 26, verse 52. Listen to this. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the the more inheritance, and to few shalt thou give the less inheritance. To everyone shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered with him. Notwithstanding, the land shall be divided by lot. Why is this so important? First of all, the word lines is the word chabel, which means it's like a rope, it's twisted. Remember Ezekiel used a line to measure the temple? Well, that's what they did in Joshua's time to measure the lot, where the lot would be, where the land would be allotted to certain tribes and certain families. And God here in the Torah is giving the directions on where the lines are to fall for those inheritances of which the strangers will sojourn as well. And then the psalmist says, thou maintainest my lot. It's the word tamak, it means he's, the Lord sustains it. He keeps it and he holds it fast for you. What the psalmist here is saying is that he is content that God holds his destiny in his hand. You want to know about, you want to know about God, read the Torah and what he does for you. Deuteronomy 32, 7, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, he'll tell you. The elders, and they'll tell you. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Oh, I thought Israel doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't mean anything. They're, they're out For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, this will make the book of Ephesians make a lot more sense. Why? Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, which is just filled with all all kinds of Hebraic overtones to it, gives you a better idea of what God is talking about when he talks about you because it's written to the faithful in Christ. Look what it says in verse 11. In whom, it's talking about Yeshua, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Now I put this in your, in your notes here. You have this little, it shows the Greek in here. And you bring that PowerPoint up for me. It says, in, in whom 
also we were chosen by lot, being predefined according to the attention of the one, all things operating according to the counsel of his will. This word here, where we were chosen by lot, it's the word eklerothamenem. And it's actually a form of two words. Uh, klerao is from kleros, it means assigning portions of land by lot. And nemo is to administer a lot, to ch actually choosing of a track of land. But the American Standard Version, I, I I put down on this as well in verse 11 it says in whom also we were made a heritage having been foreordained according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his hit will what he is saying is here we were made God's land to be tilled he's the one doing the work he's the one doing the farming and you're in that field he's cultivating you that's your inheritance. He's working on you. He's blessing Israel. He's blessing you because he's made you a heritage. Okay, well, let's look at that a little bit further. Here's what it looks like in, you know, Israel. You have land. You have different tracts. And villages were responsible, in the, say, within the tribe of Benjamin uh, or Naphtali or whatever. They would, Naphtali would occupy this certain region, and then the villages would get together and they would decide by taking lots and straws who was going to farm this track and that track and so on and so forth. That's how they did it. God's chosen, he's the one that's chosen us, and he's working on us. Do you want to let him do that? Yes. Okay. That's why Paul said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, which I read at the very beginning. Remember I said I was going to tell you? It says, we're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. What does husbandry mean? It means a cultiv cultivable, cultivatable farm. Sectioned off to be worked. God's working on you. Just let him do it. That's our inheritance. So now on a side note, in the next Torah portion, Bahukatai, it becomes even more vital than in light of this Jubilee, in light of this Shemitah, in light of enjoying God's Shabbats. Because in verse 3 of 26, it says, if you walk in my statutes, Bahukatai, and keep my commandments and do them. He's giving a condition here, if you do these. He wants you to follow his way not the ways of the world. Walking means the study of the Torah. Keeping them is learning how they're properly kept and hide the word in your heart. Remember thy word have I hid in mine heart that, we might, that I might not sin against thee. And then the doing of it. It's right in this verse. is actually carrying them out. Well, I don't see anything different happening in my life. Well, that's because you're not doing anything different. Do the Torah. These are blessings if we carry them out. And this, our Messiah came for this purpose, which Pastor Mark taught uh, not that long ago that he believes it was in, uh, during Yom Kippur, during the Jubilee, which is when the Jubilee started after Yom Kippur with the blowing of the shofar. And Yeshua came to the podium and they brought him the scroll in Luke 4, 17. It was delivered unto the book of prophet Isaiah, and when he opened it, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, good news, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's jubilee. Jubilee. That's what we look for is that final jubilee, that 50th, that brings us into the world to come when Yeshua himself will set everything right in the land of Israel and everywhere else. Now, why isn't that a topic for a movie? In a Hebraic sense. But if we don't look to this, the consequences will be severe. In Leviticus 26, 14, if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, then great plagues would come upon them. In verse 40, it says, he says, but if they, if they confess their iniquities, talking about his people, and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they've trespassed against me, and that also that they've walked contrary to me, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. 
Well, I remember, and I will remember the what? The land. Why is it such a big controversy? Because the great Satan doesn't want this to happen. Because he knows that God has something invested in that land which affects this planet and the universe. In verse 43, the land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lies desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. See, God even tells them what will happen if the land doesn't enjoy the Sabbaths. See, he's just asking them, look, if you know you're off here, if you think you're off, just say it so we can get you back on track. It's just like with our kids. When our kids do something wrong and we ask, did you do it? We just want them to take responsibility and admit it. Otherwise, they can't change. When we don't accept responsibility and change, we become callous. And just like these, you know, Mark playing the guitar, especially bass with those thick strings, or anybody who works hard as a carpenter or laborer, and you get calluses on your hands, you know what? The thicker the calluses become, the less the feeling in those parts of your hands or your feet and it becomes harder to feel the blows. That's why Pharaoh's heart was hardened, because the more he hardened it, the harder it was to feel the severity of the plague that came before him. That's why it's so important that we never get to that point and become calloused. It's why it's always necessity to stay before God every day. And if you've fallen short of his commandments, to tell him that. And ask him, tell him you're sorry. Look at this, verse 21, 26. If you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I'll bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. He doesn't want to do that. But it's because of the callousness. Rashi, who was a great rabbi and sage, he translated this word hostility along the lines of indifference. Indifference can be paralyzing to the soul. You may observe some commandments when it suits you, which becomes spiritual sloppiness. Indifference is the opposite of repentance. Repentance is change. Indifference shrugs it off. But in this half Torah in Jeremiah of Bahukatai, the great hope is in Jeremiah 17, verse 14, from which the Amidah gets this portion where Jeremiah cries out and he says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Is this where you want to be? Yes. Amen. Let's stand. Isn't God great? Amen. Tells you what's going to happen before it happens and what to do about it. You know, as we close out this service and as I pray and the worship team comes up and the Zakins come forward, if you have things you need to pray about with one of these elders, do, it, do so now. Get right today. You know, start your, your week off. This is the seventh day. On the right note with God, just have joy in your hope that everything's going to be okay. You believe everything's going to be okay? God has everything figured out. Amen? Father, we bless you today. We raise a blessing to you. How much can our blessing really be but to walk in your commandments, to, to follow your ways, to tell you every day that we love you. And Father, as just children, in the short time that we're on earth, to open our hearts to you, to do, to do the right things. Uh, Father, that beyond our comprehension there are great things in store in the world to come. Father, that's when we can joy in our hope. As Father, as we observe your Shabbat, your commandments, your Torah, and Father, to look with great hope the coming of our Mashiach, Yeshua, when all things will be made right. And so, therefore, we trust in you. Amen. God told Moses to tell Aaron how to bless his people. So even, even when we're not feeling, our emotions aren't there, God will still come to us and he will still bless us. And this is what he told him to say. Yahweh, Adonai, Vayish Marecha. Yair, Yahweh, Panavi, Alecha, Viyunecha. Yisa Yahweh Panavi Aleka Viyasem Lecha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Have a great Shabbat. Rest in him. And those of you guests, uh, we'll have some of our elders in the guest pavilion. You're welcome to join them. Contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.